green or whatever you call this. <laughs> Over to you. Okay, um, first of all, can I thank you for the opportunity to do this? Um, you know, I'm not at the moment active in the Greens, um, an over 50 year old man, um, you know, I just appreciate you giving me the time really. Um, and especially because I'm really, really interested in spreading the word about Ellen Rostrum and her interesting work. So she was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics for her work on commons um, and collective ownership. And I think she kind of changes everything. Um, so what I was going to do was talk um, briefly about the coronavirus. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about capitalism. I was going to move on to um, looking at Ellen Rostrum's work on the commons, challenging the tragedy of the commons, and then look at other ways in, help, in which she kind of helps us reach um, you know, different economy, um, which doesn't exploit the environment and has greater equality and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, it's a very strange time. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm somebody who's a writer. So, um, you know, maybe it's all I, I look forward to is just staying at home. And I've um, got my, you know, 100 bottles of homebrew and I've got my Jamaican patties and we've got some bears and, you know, I'm kind of fine. Um, but I'm aware that this is a really, you know, terrible time. Um, but since when I got politically involved in like 1980, um, the Green Movement's been concerned with catastrophe. And we have catastrophe here now. Um, I'm aware the last political meeting I did was with Ted Knight, who um, was leader of Lambeth Council, Red Ted. And, you know, he got very concerned with things like climate change. Um, and Ted sadly is no longer with us, not because of the coronavirus, but I am aware that as well as the coronavirus, maybe there's so much strain on the NHS and other people are dying. I've had a um, colleague, I'm a parish councillor, whose partner's died. Um, Carol Chant, the musician, um, died of the coronavirus. I didn't know her, but I, I do a lot of work with Michael Chant, who she was married to. And, you know, people are dying at a rate of a thousand a day. Um, Britain, I think, has got three times the deaths deaths that China had. Um, it's looking like we're probably going to have the most deaths of any European country. Um, you know, we've got countries like New Zealand, and okay, I'm not doing particularly doing party politics for the Green Party now, but I'm aware that in New Zealand there's a Green Party coalition government, and there's been one death. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the coronavirus, but I'm, I just kind of really fear that we kind of have this British kind of deference and in any society people rally to kind of governments. Um, but we've not got a government which is competent. We've got a government that delayed taking action. And we know all the kind of stories about um, people on the front line in the NHS not having the protection they need. And, you know, this is not going well. And even if it was going well, um, I appreciate a lot of people find it very, very difficult to be in isolation, be in lockdown. Um, and I think that it kind of speaks to things like the climate crisis, that we have politicians maybe um, who don't engage with science. I mean, science can be quite a complex thing, um, who are complacent. And the same way that action has been delayed over the coronavirus, and you know, most obscenely in Trump's America, but also in the UK, that's very similar to the way that we're being complacent and our governments are delaying over reducing CO2 emissions and adapting to climate change. What I want to get onto is capitalism. Um, on my Twitter account, I've got the description extremist dad. Um, and possibly I'm being a bit flippant about this, but um, yeah, I'm kind of critical of what I call as a sort of centrist parent view. And the kind of centrist view is that basically the system is fine, but you've got the wrong people in charge. Um, you've got some excesses. It's gone wrong with Trump. I think there was a Guardian article saying we should kind of go back and think about the 90s. And I would say that it's not that we've got a system which basically works and the wrong people are in charge and there are some things going wrong. 
but what we have is a whole social and economic system um, you know social formation or mode of production which I would describe as capitalism um, which is destructive and when we kind of look at the economics of this and the alternatives to it um, I don't think there's one easy straightforward solution when I was involved in the Ecology Party that then became the Green Party right back in the 80s um, the kind of economics with it in the 80s is that you would have different contending schools of economic thought you'd have people who are very concerned with basic income and you'd have other people who were georgists who believed in the land tax and you'd have social creditors concerned with debt-based money and you'd have these kind of various sort of squabbling schools of economics often with quite a bit of virtue to their economics but the idea would be that you'd have one kind of economic fix and if you sort it out like tax and you tax land as Henry George suggested in the 19th century that would kind of sort most things out now I, I don't believe this what I would say is that with capitalism um, you have a kind of whole economic system with various elements that interlock and it's not that you've got one kind of bad symptom that you take away um, to make it kind of just and that what you have with capitalism I would say is it's the idea of accumulating capital um, you know by capital we're talking about sort of machinery means of production and um, property that we can use to produce more and Karl Marx talked about accumulate accumulate is Moses and the prophets so with capitalism it's like a kind of secular religion um, everything is based around capitalism um, creating profit, creating economic growth and when you look at this kind of system I saw a, a tweet I mean not everything on social media is great was saying why is it that politicians are not putting care first whereas maybe what they're putting first is the economy and there's kind of worries about what the coronavirus is doing in terms of killing us but also the, this huge worry about what it's doing to our economy but it's not that kind of care is at the center we're not measuring all these events and saying you know how are they damaging in terms of care so capitalism to me is based on kind of property ownership um, it involves a kind of ideology of kind of individualism um, you know it's underpinned by institutions and the, the kind of political task I think this reflects what Rosie was saying very well isn't simply replacing bad people who run capitalism with nice people maybe Jeremy Corbyn or the Greens and that would change everything what we have is the much more difficult task of actually creating a new mode of production a new social formation a new culture a new way of being because what we see with capitalism is it has this intrinsic built-in demand for infinite economic growth um, and it's not that you've simply got good capitalists and bad capitalists I still think a lot of Marx's basic analysis I mean Marx of course would never finish books and would get into arguments and would go and buy cigars and you know it's a great kind of unfinished thing Marxism and who knows what he would say but the kind of basic idea that you have firms and they have to make profit because if they don't make profit they can't reinvest if they can't reinvest they will be overtaken by first adopters and this whole kind of process where you've got to have more and more growth more and more accumulation and as we know that tends to create more inequality I mean it does some good things as well in technological innovation we could argue about that um, you know it raises living standards but it's also got this tendency that was even recognized by Marx and Engels in the 19th century that it tends to degrade nature um, but as we know I think it was Frederick Jameson the, the literary critic said it's easier to think of the end of the world probably at the moment especially when we're all in our houses being isolated than the end of capitalism and I think Eleanor Ostrom has a contribution to this now in some ways Eleanor Blesser would have been appalled um, she was a very modest woman she didn't want to set up an entirely new economic system she was concerned with particular problems with land management but I still think that her work on the commons is very very useful for imagining 
an economic system after capitalism. So I'll briefly talk about what she was doing. So she was born in the 30s and she's great fun. I'm, I'll try and get you some YouTubes. Her books can be dry, but if you, you kind of ever met her, she was great, which is not something that people say about all of us who are involved with economics, or she say to me, political economy. And she was a bit like sort of the female feminist economics version of Johnny Cash. She'd go, I was born poor. And she talked about how she was born in the Depression and her parents divorced and then there was the war and how she'd have to, they'd grow like all their veg and her mum would like tin peaches and she'd go, um, oh, our houses are too big and we consume too much. And the kind of thing that economists never say. So she's great fun if you see any of her like videos and really open. Um, and I, you know, anybody who met her, we just love her. She was just great. Um, what she was concerned with is something called the tragedy of the commons. So the idea of the tragedy of the commons, you had a guy called Garrett Harding, and he was concerned with ecology, but bless him, he was a population bomber and thought that human beings were the problem and didn't look at capitalism. And his kind of metaphor is you'd have like common land, people wouldn't look after the common land, the commoners would overgraze it, and there was always like a free rider, people wouldn't conserve the commons. And he argued that if you want an ecological society, you need a really strong authoritarian government, which we don't want, and Bruce is saying you definitely don't want, um, or you kind of privatise land. And Eleanor listened to him, so she became a political economist, and, and Harding came along in the late 60s to um, Indiana, where she was teaching at the Bloom, um, you know, the, the campus, Indiana University campus. Um, and kind of got up and talked about the tragedy of the commons and said, oh, we've got a cut population and um, people should be sterilised if they've had more than one child. And Ellen Rostrum, who remained in her life very chilled, kind of got up and said, isn't this really totalitarian? And Harding said, no, this isn't totalitarian. I've got like a theory, the tragedy of the commons, that disproves this. And Eleanor thought, hey, let me invent as a husband and our colleagues, we've been researching commons for like ages. We've been looking at all these different commons and they're not tragic. Sometimes people mess up, but she kind of thought, well, quite often people have got like land or fisheries or forests that they own collectively and they don't mess up. They find rules and they ration it out and they maintain them ecologically. So basically what she was doing in terms of ecological economics is to say that we have to respect the next seven generations, which comes from kind of um, First Nations, indigenous people in North America, and that if we damage the environment, we ultimately destroy the economy. And like um, she was saying this in the kind of 60s, um, Vince, who she's married to, who's very interesting, was saying this right back in the 40s. So they've got this kind of economics where ecology is absolutely central. But what they would say is that to get a kind of economic management that works it's all about cooperation trust practices institutions so it's not about having some big blueprint of a green economy what it's about is the nitty-gritty of human behavior and to cut a long story short because i could talk about own awesome stuff for about three weeks um, she kind of looked at the different commonses aggregated the research looked at where they worked where they failed and came up with these kind of design rules. And I'd recommend looking at the design rules. And she found that if people made the rules themselves to share the commons, they were more likely to respect them. She found that if you had what was called graduated sanctions, so people overfished, they wouldn't be immediately kicked out of the um, commons or overgrazed. So these are not very vegan friendly. Um, I did have my Jack Monroe vegan cookbook just to sort of dissipate the kind of grazing and fisheries um you know but you you could find various ways you wouldn't immediately kind of kick people out the commons um you'd kind of tell people what they were doing because they might not have realized they'd broken the rules um you know it might be people who are overfishing wouldn't be served in the local pub one i particularly like with commons in japan was they um the commoners employed like a constable to kind of like police the system and that if people um, used the com overused the commons, they had to pay a fine in sake, and then presumably they would have kind of like big parties. Um, 
so I, I don't want to get too much into the kind of detail of this but normally what we do is we think of property being private and everything being private that's maybe an, an, a key thing of capitalism kind of private property ownership but what she did in a kind of very um, hard-nosed fashion very kind of thought out fashion based on lots of research is basically said um, collective ownership can work I mean she was a big advocate of cooperatives as well but it's not that human beings are kind of intrinsically cooperative or it's not that we're intrinsically kind of selfish like economists might say that we are she thought we had both of those tendencies but if you actually allow people to construct their own rules if you have democratic management if you kind of like look at what works in some situations and what fails in other situations you can actually design more effective ways of having collective ownership now what she was concerned with quite modest looking at fields and fisheries um challenging ideas about from kind of garrett harding of the tragic commons um she wasn't in herself interested in designing a whole new anti-capitalist economy and in some ways she's interesting because she kind of came from kind of more kind of free market economists um, which is really strange because her nobel lecture was entitled you know economics beyond markets and states so she kind of looked at economics where you've not got the state running everything where you've not got the free market but nonetheless you know, she originally come from quite a free market point of view the complexities of where she's coming from um, are quite strange as well so it's not kind of with her approach I think anybody's approach that you just say one person has the answer but I'd like to tease out I think some of the other ways that she's kind of useful um, in terms of like designing an anti-capitalist economy a kind of green economy I mean she believed in all the sort of right stuff about um, you know serve the people talk to the people um, you know economics being people based and based on the, the wisdom that we have as participants um, you know she very scientifically said that collective ownership could work she had this kind of ecological foundation um, so one of the things I came up with was some kind of like Ostrom kind of rules for radicals and I'll see if I can work out how to share um, I should probably stop talking as well soon and I am completely failing to share should be the share screen button just um, the is that right? I am getting lots of participants and it's a bit different to, on a phone maybe I don't know how to get anything else and I don't want to press leave because that wouldn't be <laughs> don't do that <laughs> if, if other uh, um could you kind of take um, me out put me back in again or on I'm your just phone how I get a screen I've got a screen with lots of lovely people high lovely people but I'm not <laughs> finding any way of sharing you've got the laptop and there's a green button share screen on the center button um I do need help no I haven't got that button yeah what, what you need to do on a phone take your finger and like swipe across until oh, you oh smart um so I'm getting lots and lots and lots and lots of lovely so go people. the other way Go the other way, way. and even <laughs> see yourself. Yeah, right. And then when you click and on the screen, you should have the button. Yes, and yeah. Way. Nice so one. Thank you, mysterious voice. Competent. <laughs> um, so, what have I got? I've got rules. It looks like it's loading something, or you're frozen. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not a good sign it's probably just me laughing you manic. showed me one earlier um, yeah it worked fine earlier oh i've got share aha aha nice. okay there so we go. We've got go it. Through these. Great. um so she's very much kind of think about institutions so quite often in politics it's like hey we'll replace the good people with that we'll no that's the other way around isn't it it's, that's the labor party hq isn't it that you replace the good people with bad people we want to replace the bad people with good people but should say think about the actual institutions um so institutions are kind of like organizations made up of practices 
and you need to really look at the nitty gritty of how they work. So if you're elected onto things, I mean, I'm, on, I'm just on parish council, which is the, the lowest level of, you know, kind of governmental power, very important. So, you know, just from being on it for like about 10 years, I kind of understand a bit more about the rules and how it works and the personalities. So you need that kind of institutional knowledge pose social change as a problem as problem solving so she wasn't kind of going hey the commons are always perfect she wasn't doing the kind of ideological thing where we like believe in something and we're really passionate about it and though that's great what she do instead is say that there's like a problem so the problem is how do we manage things like fisheries how do we manage property that can't be privatized um you know that's a problem so what she would say is things like climate change is a lot climate change is you pose it as a problem it's not that you've already got an automatic solution so it's this kind of problem solving approach i think is great big on embrace diversity um she was like super intersectional before you know other people talking about this because she would say that a lot of things are about knowledge and you need lots of different as well as the sort of justice and exploitation you need people with radically different views to get diversity to generate knowledge to solve problems um, if you are going to deal with things be very specific um, so again i'm doing some sort of climate work on my parish council and it's trying to look at all of our specific practices um, you know i know extinction rebellion is lovely and great but you know it's not just the slogan of an of a emergency it's like what do we actually do listen to the people this is particularly if you're kind of economists rarely do that very big on self-government that it is possible right through society for democratic deep democracy self-governance but that doesn't just happen that doesn't happen automatically you've got to learn and educate and so on so i've got various other things everything changes you can map power um so i can kind of send you these things like no panaceas there's no kind of just one thing that works um, so maybe I'll kind of begin to wrap up. Um, so the coronavirus, it's a failure of care in Britain, failure of science. And I think um, Ellen Ostrom is all about putting care back into economics. Um, but we have capitalism as a whole social and economic system, which seems so destructive. And it really gets into our pause and you know affects our dreams and shapes everything and we can't see anything beyond it um one element there are many within capitalism is kind of property ownership so ostrom's very very good actually saying we can own property in a different way we can be ecological so that kind of goes into the mix as usual this is this men over 50 thing i'm talking far far too much but i'll try and share and get through a couple more things um, so I touch the screen in the middle and I touch share and bear with me. So I've got a few more things I was just going to kind of go through. Um, so this is like Cricklade, which is a commons in Wiltshire, which I can't go and see at the moment. And um, it's been managed as a commons for like over a thousand years and it's a beautiful um, you know nature habitat and i was going to share some more things but i probably shouldn't share too many because it takes a little bit of getting into and i was going to just give you a eleanor ostrom picture so there's eleanor ostrom when she won her nobel prize and she was super nice and talked to everybody and uh, I went and talked to her a couple of times and sadly we lost her in 2012 um, but she was like really supportive as an academic um, academia I work in academia it's not always brilliant to be honest so she was really kind of saying as academics we need to be far more collective that if you're dealing with ecological problems you need like really good social scientists and natural scientists and getting away from this kind of individual research um you know she saw herself very much as a bigger team and bless her the day before she died from the hospital bed she was still helping her phd students and when i i got to interview her and I'll, I'll send you the video if you're interested um i didn't realize that she was really ill and dying of cancer and she gave me time and just really great human 
Um, and final thing, I was just going to give you some more really important revolutionary women, and then I will completely shut the fuck up. So, Ella Baker. Um, so the kind of politics I'm involved with now is kind of base building, like Philly Socialists, if you know about them. And you might have come across this really great organisation called the Ella Baker School of Organising. Um, and Ella Baker was an African-American woman in Mississippi. And there's loads of voter suppression still, lots of racism still in Mississippi and across the states. By the way, if you look at Mississippi, you've got um, Corporation Jackson, Carly Acuno, um, with a big eco-socialist project, African-American. And Ella Baker would go and teach um, other people the American Constitution because there was a racist literacy test to stop African-Americans voting. And she would teach people, um, you know, read and write and American constitutions, they get to vote only on the condition that they would go and teach other people. So get, I'd really kind of stress the Ella Baker school. They're really good in terms of practical tools. And there's one other thing I was going to say before I stop. Um, I'm on safe driving mode. And final thing, which I really like. Um, I, I really like this from Angela Davis. So Angela Davis is still around. Um, great American political figure um, in the US Communist Party, but was far too cool really for the US Communist Party, which I think, bless them, they're not an amazingly cool, but I don't get into all that. And I really like this just to finish. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. So I think that sums up the kind of Ostrom stuff really. So I shall stop. Thank you for having me. Great, thank you so much, Derek. That was um, incredible. And like, yeah, not bad screen sharing on a phone and complicated. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> you, you're being very nice. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't have known. I was useless. So uh, thank you to the mysterious voice. But no, that was a brilliant like introduction. So thank you so um, much. I've been trained um, up by Emily, who's <laughs> do you want to just come and say hi. Hi. <laughs> There we go. Thank you so much. I am still in the group. Yeah, okay. There we go. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, we've got some questions that have been coming in, but um, if anybody would like to still send them through, please do. Um, you can send them through to me. Um, so I'm the Rosie Rule questions here in brackets. Um, so just send them through in the chat. Um, but we've got a few to kick off, if that's all right, Derek. Um, um, <laughs> hey, it's a Tuesday evening. Um, um, so the first question we have is um, from Chris and it is, um, what do you see the relationship between state, cooperative and commons ownership? How could these complement each other in a post-capitalist society and what elements of the economy should be in each form? Oh, that's really difficult. Big one. Um, I think what I would kind of conceptualise Eleanor Ostrom as saying, which isn't exactly the same as what I'm saying, is the idea of a really mixed economy. So what she kind of believed in is not just a mixed economy where you have the state and the state isn't great and the market, which isn't great. I'm not that she was radically really against either. Um, but you actually have a really mixed economy and you've got a whole kaleidoscope of different institutions between the state and the market. Um, so I would say with states, um, you know, that, I mean, I'm not a thoroughgoing libertarian, um, but I think there are huge problems with the state. States get things wrong a lot. And what you, I've always kind of written this, the kind of slogan is what you want to be doing is constantly rolling back the state and rolling back the market and decommodifying. Um, so, okay, not everybody drinks beer, but sort of illustration of this is you could have some kind of like state brewing company, which might be good, I don't know, um, or you could kind of buy beer privately. But what you could do is you could have, um, as well as your home brew, like in every community, like a brew house that people had collective access to. And it's this kind of idea of massively expanding the non-commodified bit of the economy. However, what you have in any economy, Ostrom teaches us, is like rules, 
institutions you can never get through them even if you've got a very much market-based economy and, and the main body that constructs rules is still the state so the state can construct rules to increase the commons or to contract the commons so if you see a lot of the kind of poor mason post-capitalism and the idea of 3d printing what you have is like massive restrictions that have come in that people are not aware of to copyright things which are produced to make it difficult for us to download um you know in terms of 3d printing um so you know one element for the state is to have kind of copyright legal rules which are based on usufruct which is the idea that people have got access to things if they use them in you know an ecological way and so on um so you know there's there's a role for the state we're not totally getting rid of the market but what we're doing is kind of shrinking those creating more decommodified activity and actually one of the things where Ostrom is very radical is to say there's a whole potential kaleidoscope of different institutions and ways of doing things so I, I kind of often say say to people with Ostrom it's kind of like um traditional economics is kind of like black and white television and she's bringing in color or 3d or whatever um so it's kind of a big question which i probably haven't answered that well but th those are my initial thoughts great thank you so much no fabulous big questions big answers <laughs> um so we have an, another we have a, quite a few questions coming about scale. I'm going to, I've got one from Kevin and one from Amy. So Kevin starts with, um, so my main question about managing things in common um, along the principles of Ostrom is a question of scale and contradiction, which is seems to be inherent in the idea of local autonomy and direct democracy and the need to manage relations with other communities. And on a regional, national and international scale, how can we take the practice of self-government to a greater scale without recreating a centralised system? And sort of similarly on similar lines, Amy asks, um, do you think, for example, food cooperatives or, um, are realistic on a wide scale? OK, um, so Ostrom studied particular things which were basically local commons. And she was quite keen to say, what works for the ones I've studied, you can't automatically extrapolate. However, um, she had this kind of concept of polycentric systems. Um, poly, you know, we know is like many. And the idea was she would say that what you need for good governance is lots of different messy overlapping systems. And there are two reasons for this. One is, as people rightfully say, not everything happens at the local. So I'm very conscious when I, I look at, um, go and visit Cricklade, and they've got the commons and they go back to Saxon times and they've got all this kind of management that goes back to kind of Saxon times um, of how to run them and they're radically democratic and so on and so forth. Um, and in some way they've kind of existed through feudalism and capitalism and so on. But um, the water meadows are a product of the, the Thames. And then with climate change, you have climatic conditions that then affects and can mess up um you know the, the water meadows and austin was very very concerned with you know climate change as a global thing so what she would say is that you need to kind of reproduce kind of good governance and commons relationships on a whole series of different levels um i mean what i would say is that we you know in a kind of pre system we don't have very much governance of the self you know, we have our kind of incompetent governments that kind of impose upon us. And, you know, we need more local democracy, um, you know, more powerful local government, regional structures. Um, you know, so though there's not maybe a blueprint for solving every problem with this, we certainly need more of the kind of very micro, um, the local, the regional. Um, also kind of Ostrom's work, which is about cooperation, overcoming free rider problems, I think is quite good for um, looking at things like global climate agreements. So I, I can send you more stuff about what she did on climate change. Um, I think food cooperatives, great idea. Um, I mean, I suppose where I am concerned with kind of government structures, I'm on my parish council. So, you know, one thing we may look at, I have to see what people on the council think, what they think in the communities, we've got quite a bit of land. Um, you know, community orchards, 
Um, one thing which I saw, which was great in Hastings. So I went to Hastings, which was um, very big because we saw the, the stage play about who killed Cornelius Cardew, Britain's most important Marxist, but I digress. And in Hastings, they had like um, by the side of the road, a little communal herb garden where people go and pick any of their herbs. So I think there are ways that you can decommodify food. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Derek. I may just go and get a bottle open it. <laughs> Start the homebrew bottle. Oh, it gives me time to find the next question then. Um, I was going to move um, uh, to, um, how long have we got? Yeah, um, so one we have sort of like on a similar um, level around scale is actually like a, a question around sort of geographically bounded communities. So Sam has a question um, that says, Ostrom focused many of her examples on geographically bounded communities that have a built up common history. So how does this work either where the community have been divided or with tragedy of the com commons problems where there is no com common community or the community is exclusive of a certain subsection? Um, yeah, I think that throws up a couple of different things. One is um, commons are not automatically the solution. Um, I don't think there's any one thing which is automatically the solution and you certainly need a kind of intersectional approach because you have commons which exclude people, um, you know there's been kind of systems where you've had um, you know lots and lots of commons in India but it would reflect the caste system in that the people who did all the work were the people at the you know at the, the lower castes and there's a whole literature around commons and conflict that you can exclude particular groups of the community. Um, however, if you look at the functioning of commons, those should kind of talk about, you have some kind of boundary and you negotiate within the community. Um, she wasn't saying that this necessarily involved some imagined community that had existed for thousands of years. To her, what's happening is you've constantly got change, you've constantly got kind of negotiation. And what she's most fundamentally about is how you actually negotiate between different groups and people so you build trust. So I would say to an extent, there's a kind of misunderstanding of what she's doing, that she wasn't kind of saying, there's a group of commoners who have a shared culture, and this automatically means that it's going to work. I mean, okay, there were certainly commons she studied that worked over hundreds of years. In a sense, what she's saying is that commons are always contested. So in fact, where, where she and Vince started doing their work was looking at West Basin, which is like a water, uh, water system in California, basis of the film Chinatown, if you've seen that. And there was lots of conflict because you had all the different users taking the water out. And that was a potentially a tragedy because if too many farmers, too many people took water out, you'd lower the water table and then that would suck in salt water and destroy the system. And there was lots of drama and court cases and conflict, but there was still enough negotiation not to destroy the commons. And in a certain way, remember, she's the kind of prophetess of diversity, but she would say that there are always problems ecologically, problems in terms of kind of human society, and that it's, you know, problems around knowledge. And if you actually have diversity, you create more knowledge. I hope that gets to some way to it. And was there another question I've now missed? I get, I've got very into the, that question. I think there might've been another one. Uh, they, they kind of tie together, I think. Okay. Um, I've, I'm hoping that's all right, Sam, because I want to move on. Anyway, <laughs> um, maybe that, I think that, that, that covered um, um, the question perfectly. Thank you so much. Um, the next one, I guess, is um, well, actually, very quick and simple, just because I think, like, just in case anyone else is wondering this question, uh, Eddie's got a question that is, does capitalism definitely require economic growth? And if so, why? Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, what I would say, and I... I Kind of said it before um, what kind of Marx identifies is that um, firms need to maximize profit yeah so the, the you know a lot has changed since Marx wrote but I still think this kind of works so what Marx would say is that you 
have to gain profit so you can reinvest because if you don't reinvest say in the latest technology and this kind of fits very much at the moment in the crisis we're in um, other firms will invest in the technology and what happens with constant technological innovation is on the one hand the early adopters make more money but with technological innovation you can produce more goods it increases supply so whether you believe in the labor theory of value or whether you believe in the conventional economics in terms of demand and supply with technological innovation you increase supply that tends to lower price that tends to lower profit margins and this whole kind of system what happens is wherever people are producing a particular good um, profitability crudely tends to fall so there's this kind of tendency to kind of commodify and develop new parts of the economy to keep making money and okay a lot has changed since Marx wrote Marx could think of kind of counter tendencies but there does seem to be this kind of I'm putting it very crudely this kind of cycle where firms need to make profit they need to reinvest unless they're pushed out by other firms um, other people have talked about debt and repayment of debt. Um, there's also this kind of idea that in unequal societies, if you get growth, it kind of buys people off. So there are a whole series of reasons why growth is functional to capitalism. But what I would say with capitalism, I'm, I'm very much would argue that we must avoid reductionism. And I, um, I use the term overdetermined. And this comes from Freud, bless him. I've not read enough Freud and all sorts of problems with Freud. But in the interpretation of dreams, he would say that dreams are overdetermined. They're not caused by one thing. And with capitalism, you have a whole series of interacting kind of causes. And what we have is a kind of culture, as I say, in our society based on individualism. We have an academic economics that stresses kind of methodological individualism. Um, we have kind of more and more things culturally which are about competition so there are a whole series of kind of things within capitalism that drive growth so of course one of the things i'm interested in is kind of degrowth prosperity without growth and the idea of prosperity without growth if you've seen the, the tim jackson book or i could send my paper on it is that maybe we could produce things that lasted longer commons we could kind of have social sharing um, you know, ways of actually having access to material goods and the material things we need with less growth. Um, I could probably talk about growth all day, which is a thing that Greens and ex-Greens and whatever do too much. Um, but, you know, we just think about the way that we have devices that we're using and that there's this kind of need that firms have for devices to be replaced so they can sell us more devices. Um, I mean, I suppose the argument would be that maybe with European Union circular circular economy legislation, you might have a kind of be able to reform the economic system so it works. But I think there are quite deeply ingrained um, interlocking tendencies within capitalism for growth, um, and growth, you know, tends to be ecologically problematic. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, I'm going to then move us on to the, the post-capitalist society question um, and how we do it. We've had a few of these kind of questions um, and Rowan has brought us in um, with uh, so this dismantling and reconstruction of the economic institutions. Should it happen gradually or in a more revolutionary fashion? Why? And if, in fact, do we need to fully dismantle before we reconstruct? Mm. Uh, both. Um, so you know what you're looking at is a change in the economic cultural social system and it would be much easier just to say things are fine um or equally you could say things are not fine but anything else would be even worse but given these kind of tendencies that we've only had a relatively short time of industrial capitalism and you know we're already looking like we're we're wrecking the global climate um, and we've got more and more crisis. I'm kind of aware, um, you know, I've done this with you, um, last political event, the person who organized it died, not of coronavirus, but it, it, you know, like I say, there's people dying because of pressure on the NHS. Um, political event I did before was a meeting in Middlesbrough and it was in the middle of Storm Dennis. Um, you know, and we, we nearly didn't get there. And, you know, there's, there's kind of, 
you know, so the, the system isn't viable. So what you need is a kind of break. You need kind of revolution, if you call it, a break in the system, a new system, a new way of doing things. But you need to prepare for that radical change. And once you've had the radical change, um, you know, what you need are institutions and new ways of doing things. So, um, you know, the Ostrom thing was a collective project. So like Vince Ostrom in, in many ways quite libertarian, in some ways quite, quite right wing and curmudgeonly, in other ways absolutely fucking wonderful, would say, yeah, I agree with the idea of the Marxist withering away of the state. But wherever Marxists have tried to create states, they've not actually thought seriously enough about the institutions. Um, and I could get onto my kind of critique of what went wrong with the kind of Bolshevik revolution. So even where you do have very radical change, you've got to actually create new institutions. And those cannot, you know, good ideas don't drop from the sky. And good institutional practices don't drop from the sky. What you do is you come up with the best kind of research, look at, look at what works, what doesn't work. And above all, you kind of engage and involve people. Um, I don't think anybody has got like one clear certain path of political change. I know particularly in Britain, um, you know, we can look at a lot of the problems in the Labour Party um, and what's gone wrong with Corbyn. Um, and then people can then look at the Greens and, and Greens, um, you know, think of the, the Green, you know, I think Greens do a lot of good, but quite often Green parties have gone into kind of centre ground coalitions. And I think there's a very dubious coalition in Austria at the moment. If you look at the revolutionary um, left in Britain, I mean, many of them my friends and I love them, but on the whole, would they be able to organise a large picnic, let alone create, you know, revolutionary change? Um, so it's a bit like all paths are blocked. What I'm very passionate about is kind of focusing up on the idea of capacity building. Um, so what I really like is this idea of base building. Um, you know, so I'm not knocking doing electoral politics. I'm certainly not knocking everything the Green Party does or the, the Labour left. Um, but, you know, what I'm very much into is kind of base building where the idea in a community, you get involved with things like ACORN, who are like the um, deal with housing, um, you know, these new kind of grassroots trade unions, kind of, um, in, in, and sometimes old ones, international workers of the world. And what I'm really inspired by, and I'd go and have a look at this, what I'm kind of selling people is kind of Philly socialists and Philly socialists, you know, got their tenants group, they've got their community garden. And it's not, you know, you know, it's not mainly about we're ideologically different from other groups in Philadelphia. It's basically about how do we actually build? So they're kind of, they've got lots of capacity. They've built this over years. Um, you know, this kind of model of build the base, serve the people, and they're taking around to food to people who are vulnerable. So, um, you know, I think whether we're, we're Greens or Marxists or whatever, we should think far more about strategy. Um, I've got passionate disagreements on many things with Roger Hallam. Um, I was going to find the Roger Hallam book. Um, yeah, the, the kind of common sense of the 21st century. I must admit, I hate the idea of anything called common sense. And, um, but one of the good things about his book um, is he's really trying to think strategically. So I will stop rambling on there. But oh, yeah, that's great. More about strategy. Thank you so much. Um, and on the topic of strategy, <laughs> we've got um, a couple of questions um, about breaking the narrative. So how do we break the monopoly of neoliberal capitalism narrative um, at the local level um, under current circumstances, first past the post electoral systems and media dominated by um, following that narrative slavishly? Should we start with the commonality of our experience of the pand uh, pandemic? Secondly, how do you share that message with regular voters who are not necessarily versed in academic economic theories? And Albie also asks, that was from Tom, and Albie also asks how um, can we convince those who still support capitalism or perhaps conservatives in general or even those people who feel they benefit from the current situation um, that this is time for radical change in our society? Okay, um, I mean, I've got thoughts on that because I'm a parish councillor, I'm living in quite a kind of conservative area and I think just, just listen to people, um, you know, so you know with, with the parish council I've really kind of like talked to my colleagues who'd have like very very different politics from me 
um, but just try to kind of engage them in terms of practical stuff on climate change. And one of the things we did, which was great, you know, I've been really, really inspired by is we, we came up with a climate change working groups, this is the parish council, and we asked all of the staff for their ideas on climate change. So, you know, I'm talking about all sorts of radical politics, but just ask people. So whether it's kind of Ostrom stuff, which in some ways has come a bit from a more conservative direction, although she's all this visionary, amazing stuff, or whether it's the, the kind of fully socialists, they've both got a starting point of like, go around and talk to people. Um, so I know you've, you've come across an organization called Red Fight Back, and I've got criticisms of Red Fight Back, but I went drinking when the people at Headset, because we both used to do international green work. And there's a lot I disagree with Red Fight Back, um, but you know, they'll go around, knock on people's doors, door to door, which I think they've got from the Green Party. Um, you know, and it's like, listen to people. Um, in terms of media, never, ever read the fucking Guardian. Um, I mean, I think the Guardian, um, I mean, it's to write for them, but whenever there's been really important progressive change, because they're kind of seen as something as centre left, they've come up and absolutely trashed it. So I know if we look at Jeremy Corbyn, not perfect and very controversial, but every single fucking day he was leader, they attacked him without end. And whenever I've seen things which are really key and really important, like go back to like the second Gulf War, when it's come down to it, the Guardian and the Observer have done dreadful things. Um, ultimately maybe they're as damaging as the sun and the mail and so on and so forth so if there's one thing i take from you is never click on the guardian um they really really are bad um you know i think it was racist abuse of diana abbott all these terrible things and okay you get some good things the guardian do um but you know they're a bit like the labor hq staff they're like the media version we think that we're paying them and buying the paper and they're the good people um but they're not um, I think in terms of communication, um, we've got a really, you know, if you, you argue with people, it never kind of works, um, you know, and we get onto these, all these Twitter disputes and so on, and I do this, we all do this, but it's just like talking and engaging, and I, um, I'd really recommend, um, I don't know if it's come around the wrong way, but George Marshall's book, Don't Even Think About It. And he, you know, really, really wonderful book on how you communicate with people. Um, I mean, I think what you have to do, it's a bit like the, the Angela Davis thing about radical transformation or being like water, wherever we are, we just, just seep in and do things and engage with people. Um, you know, some, I'm in a, you know, kind of rural Berkshire, which is just fantastic for social distancing. Um, you know, it's not kind of... Um, you know the kind of red base really um you know but you know i've talked to like the you know there's a the local priests i mean a, i'm you know fairly thorough kind of kind of church going atheist but like my my local priest is very engaged with climate change so like engage with people talk to people but i'd look at the george marshall stuff for the kind of expertise on how to do it um emily's just shouting out about her project which was seven generations so what she did was put Ellen Ostrom's speech on seven generations to music and got like a children's choir and got it out there. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the basic message, if you want to really transform the world and do really radical things, is like listen to people and um, yes. you know kind of really look at the best research on things and you know engage. Thanks so much, Derek. Great. And um, we're running, we've run over time, but I've just enjoyed the questions, so I hope others don't mind too much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's been so fantastic to have you. Like we did have one last question. I wondered if you might even be able to answer in a one sentence. I can, what, um, I can it's, do that. I, who knows? It's, it's a big, maybe not. It's quite, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a challenge. But we have from Martin, one of Ostrom's rules was to be specific. So what specific proposal would you like to see the Green Party put forward right now? <laughs> um, I would like them specifically to come up with a handbook for parish councillors to transform their parish councils. Excellent, nice one, perfect. <laughs> perfect in time, yeah, start from the oh, grass. I, I was really gonna say, do get online and look at the Alabake uh, stuff, because they've got, do lots of online, they've got a thing on this Friday, 11 o'clock on Friday, they've got online training, 
in terms of narratives and communication. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm after is a kind of, you know, extreme left, but practical. Yeah, not counting people stuff. Yeah, excellent. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me. No, thank you. Thank you. Again, it's difficult to do clapping and applause online, but I'm sure like, I can see smiling, nodding faces. Okay, and like we've had over 100 true. people on this call for an hour, which has been wonderful. So yeah, I think thank that's you for testament. Putting up with me for an hour. <laughs> Not at all. Um, like, in general, like, it, I think it's been such an important conversation to have. And it's been um, it's so in line with some of the things that we've been talking about as the young Greens and like um, especially having that hard look at where power lies and um, like having it also serious, like seriously questioning the current institutions that um, we're seeing dominate and basically rig the system um, for so many of us. Like, the young greens, the cutting edge, so keep cutting. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, but yeah, this is just the start and these are huge things to be thinking about, but we like to, yeah, be ambitious and, 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 st and yeah, I guess start from scratch and really look um, hard at some of these big questions so that we can move towards um, building up our campaigns, building our movement um, where power lies. And like, I think some of the themes that um, you've been talking about um, really resonate, Derek, where we've been seeing that currently like change isn't going to happen. It's not going to come from the bosses. It's not going to come from the courts. It's not going to come from the landlords. It's not going to come from the government right now. And so um, this idea of base building, this idea of like seriously rebuilding and rethinking how we work um, in our communities, in our institutions, we're seeing right now, um, like, so like society at the grassroots really proving where change comes from, right? Like it's the schools, it's the mutual aid groups it's it's a whole new way of working that we really want to learn from um, and energize and and utilize at this time so that's hopefully what we'll be doing more of in our series of talks but I want to have like a yeah a massive round of applause or wave hands to say thanks so much because well, um, it was terrific I'm to have waving you. my hands uh, back to <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah. thank you <laughs> so uh, yeah so wonderful to have you and back, come back anytime but also thank you to all of you who have been on the call um 95 of you have stuck with us even though i've gone way over time it's my <laughs> i'm a, my smallest uh, my yeah the, the my weakest skill is timekeeping <laughs> but um but yeah we just wanted to say thank you so much there are a few as we've said before there are a load of um events still coming up and once again i'm just going to pass over to matthew to tell you a little bit more about those um and another kind of final ask uh yeah and um, thanks for that, Rosie. um yeah so we we've got loads coming up um as Rosie said like next week we're hearing from adam ramsey who's the editor of open democracy in the uk um about our our undemocratic political system and how we can start to overhaul that and what needs to be done um we're hearing from sean berry we're um we're hearing from Assad Raymond, who's the director of War and Want, which is a great campaigning radical charity. Um, so we've got loads coming up um, and I won't labour it, but please, please, if you can, if you have a stable income right now, um, it's not true of everyone, but if you do, um, please consider giving us just one or two quid a month. Um, it'll really help us um, boost our events, make sure they reach um, as many people as we can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it from me. I'm done now, I promise. Thank you so much. I'm dropping these links in the chat. So yeah, so we've got Adam Ramsey's coming up um, next week. He's the editor of Open Democracy UK, bringing um, an incredible... Oh, that link isn't clickable, says so someone. He, oh, he has right, enjoyed my homebrew. Um, he's, uh, he's been here and had the homebrew. <laughs> I'll, I'll try it again. But in any case, you can also follow this um, link. Um, one of the things that we've found to be really um, important about this is trying to get the word out. So whether and then these talks are open to not just members of the Green Party, um, it's to anyone that you think would be interested. So if you can help us and um, you enjoyed this talk, you'd like to see more of them. Um, we'd love it if you could. <laughs> now, I'm going to put the um, word some words in your mouth now, basically via Twitter. But if I am going to link put this None of the links are clickable. It's a problem with Zoom. Copy and paste it in the, is the answer. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, this link that I'm about to post is a click to tweet that apparently they don't, they, you can't just click them. You have to copy and paste it. How old school is that? We thought we were all new and happening with Zoom, but sorry about that. Um, but yeah, the, the small link that I've just put in is a click to tweet. If you click on that, it will bring up a pre-filled tweet that basically says, you really enjoyed this call and you'd love for other people to come to the next one, which is Adam Ramsey. So if you can, we'd love for you to share that. Um, the donation link as well is um, just above. And on our website, you can see our whole host of calls.
but we've been going on forever and it's been wonderful but it is time for us all to go and do whatever you do at 10 past nine <laughs> on a Tuesday Bye. evening um, it's a, a delight to have you and we really look forward to seeing you all soon um, solidarity all and catch you next time thanks so much thanks guys thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, cheers. Bye. thanks Derek Bye, cheers.